Coming now for the next couple of echoes is to do a lot of presentations on the impact of uh, COVID-19 on our work that we do together. Um, <clears throat> today, I'm going to start just by summarizing all of the Im important information that's been flying every by everybody's email. Um, and then we're going to offer you resources. Uh, we'll post it to the, uh, the Wraparound Ohio website so you can get it. I am not going to go into the amount of detail that's on PowerPoint because it's so much. And again, like I said, there's a lot of resources being shared. Joining me today in, in the discussion will be Bobby Beal and uh, Rachel Sorg from Claremont County. Uh, we're all pleased to have her uh, uh, joining us and sharing her wisdom on service coordination and wraparound. Um, so, you know, again, we keep hearing about thanking all the frontline providers. Um, I still haven't heard behavioral health in there, so I thought <laughs> I'd create a slide called the forgotten frontline providers. Um, so thanks again, everybody, for doing what you do. Um, you know, we recognize you're on the front lines, that you are first responders, um, and that you have to respond to families in crisis. So, um, you know, we're in this together. Um, this is a situation that many of us have, none of us have been in before, um, and we're figuring it out on the fly. Um, throughout the presentation, we're not going to have enough time to do a lot of, uh, well, any discussion per se, um, but we do want your feedback on how this is impacting you and uh, what you're doing that's unique um, to um, navigate this new new world. Um, <clears throat> keep in mind throughout today, we're going to give you resources that your local agency, located in your county and state, um, is the bottom line decision maker uh, for safe practice. Um, so anything that we're giving you really doesn't countermand anything that your agency or county is telling you uh, that you have to do. Um, this is a very, I, I, I was in this morning because um, this came out from Director Chris of Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services uh, late yesterday. Um, and it details just some important uh, points that I want to put, put out there for everybody. Um, the, the first one is that um, ODM, the Department of Medicaid and uh, MHAS uh, as well as the Council of Social Worker Board will be issuing um, new guidance on rule, emergency rules for telehealth. Uh, those are forthcoming. Um, we are urgently expecting them. Um, and it will help guide a lot of the telehealth, you know, what we do with telehealth and how we utilize it. Um, I think the other most important thing here is that because we're in a world that is brand new, um, and I'm anticipating some of the things we do to be retroactively um, reimbursed, and that's just me thinking that, um, document everything you're doing. Track it all, document it all. Um, there's a lot of changes being made, and, and we're hopeful that at least some of what we do can be reimbursed by telehealth mechanisms. Um, this notification came out on March 17th, um, and this is from the Office of Civil Rights at Health and Human Services. Um, and basically what it is, is it's, a, um, in, it's enforcement discretion uh, to not impose um, sanctions for noncompliance to HIPAA, okay? Um, and in this, um, guidance. There's lots of information in, in the next couple of slides go over that. Um, but here's the, um, the website where you can grab the, the complete. Uh, and then we will also post this online. So the emergency notice allows covered health care providers um, to use different applications that they normally uh, wouldn't have been allowed to use without the risk of uh, sanctions. 
and that includes Apple FaceTime, Facebook Messenger video chat, Google Hangouts video or Skype. Um, providers are asked to notify clients that these third-party applications are, are potentially um, introduce privacy risks so that it's informed that they're, we're using this together. But this is brand new. Um, there's some additional guidance on um, using um, telehealth um, and the allowances that they're um, making. And so that's what this slide is all about. Um, they divide this up into public facing and non-public facing telehealth options. So non-public health, non-public facing telehealth options include Skype for Business, UpDocs, up VC, some of these I've never heard of, Zoom for Healthcare, um, DocsyMe, Google G Suite, Hangouts Meet. These um, are actually HIPAA compliant um, options regardless of this new um, guidance they're giving us. The ones that I mentioned here, Apple FaceTime, Facebook Messenger, et cetera, are not normally considered HIPAA compliant, but they're being allowed during the crisis. Um, these are public facing options that you can't use still, um, which are Facebook Live, Twitch, TikTok, um, and similar video communication applications that are public facing. Um, and should not be used. Um, they also, the Office of Civil Rights also put out a memo on um, privacy and HIPAA um, as it relates to obligations to protect personal health information. And I thought this was relevant basically because um, you know, there's so much stigma with the virus itself, and when you put that on top of the stigma related to mental health, uh, we still have to uh, protect the client's privacy as much as possible. There are some exceptions, and they're listed um, on this um, guidance letter from Office of Civil Rights, and you can find that on the internet. Okay, I got through that quickly. Um, I'm sure your head is spinning. We've got more resources at the end of the PowerPoint, again, which we'll share on the internet. Um, one of the things we want to get to is, you know, what everybody's doing, what are your concerns. Um, you know, in the chat box, as I do this, we would love to hear some of the concerns out there, um, some of the creative ideas that you're implementing. Um, and what safety precautions that you're taking. We're going to get into what we are doing. Okay. <laughs> so the first thing, um, and I'm going to ask um, Rachel to help me out here, uh, is we're talking about practice adaptations, and I'm really going to focus on uh, Children and Families First Council, okay? and wraparound and service coordination. A lot of the folks that attend ECHO um, are our local FCFCs and their partners. Uh, and so we want to talk about some of the adaptations if we're going to go to a telehealth option um, and some of the modalities that we thought through the other day actually in, in this right. emergency situation. So Rachel, do you want to go over some of these then? Um, yeah. And so we have been exploring here in Claremont County a couple of different ways to do service coordination or wraparound team meetings. Um, we've been exploring both using the free GoTo conference um, line numbers, which sadly have malfunctioned during team meetings, but also Zoom GoTo meeting type formats such as this. Um, right now we are really liking this Zoom format. It seems to work really well. What we're hearing from families is that I still want to see my team members faces um, which I think is a very interesting and telling thing because I think it offers a sense of comfort to them to actually see their team members see that they're doing okay have the team members see them as well too so that seems to be one that we're probably going to be using um, first and foremost whenever possible um, now every county is different we actually had a learning community yesterday with Northwest Ohio and Southwest Ohio 
And it was really interesting to hear which counties at this point are saying, no, you're not allowed to do face-to-face -face meetings with your families at all, and which ones are still open to that. Here in Claremont County, at this point in time, if a family feels okay with us coming into the home or um, they're comfortable with coming to the office, we will do keeping the six feet of social distancing, we will kind of be the hub for where that go to, that Zoom or that go to meeting is and have other team members kind of come in um, and join that way. I think what really makes this the most challenging is what is the content of our conversations? What is the content of our planning? Because like I, Rick and I were talking about earlier this week, you know, when myself and Neil and other wraparound trainers go and train, we really tell everybody community-based, community-based, get people out in community, help them make connections. And now we're in a situation where we're actually telling people to be more isolated and to practice social mm -hmm. distancing. So this is a big rub against our wraparound plans and our service coordination plans that we've been spending so long creating with these families. And so, we have to make that shift, I think, for the time being until we can wrap our heads around this a little bit more, until maybe, mm -hmm. hopefully, one day things calm down a little bit out there in the world on what do wrap plans look like right now. And we talked yesterday with those two learning communities in the Northwest and the Southwest about probably one of the best things we can do in our continued team-based setting, whether it's on conference calls or it's like a Zoom format, is actually really crisis planning. Um, how can we help families come up with plans and find ways to manage potential frictions and rubs in their family dynamic that can easily turn into a crisis or a safety issue? So what are creative ways we can do that and what are ways that our help as community partners can change when so many of our services can't actually come to the door and help hands on. So those are the conversations we are having. Those are the conversations we're seeing families want to have and what we feel like at this point in time makes is the most helpful thing to do. A lot of our families are actual wrap plans are almost on hold for the most part and then we're switching gears at the moment to this type of conversation. Very, very helpful, um, Rachel. Um, we put in a couple of slides related to, um, you know, utilizing video conferencing um, and how that might work. And I think Rachel um, talked about that. Um, you know, if you're going to do a full-blown service coordination wraparound meeting, there probably need to be new ground rules. Um, for a telehealth meeting. Um, the other thing that you need to be conscientious of is you still will need to do a consent for, you know, whatever you're doing to include a telehealth modality because usually our consents include that. Um, and then plan for possible disconnection uh, during video conference sessions. You know, are you ending? Are you backing it up with a phone number? What happens if the technology fails? So these are some things that we're actively just kind of adding as, as, as we, we go through this. Um, Rachel said, you know, facilitating meetings remotely is certainly not our preference, but it is the reality. And so what are some of the challenges? Um, you know, I think establishing and maintaining relationships and engagement and connections remotely um, that we, you know, work so hard to build. Um, if it's going to be an interactive meeting, how do you facilitate and structure the interaction? Um, and as Rachel and I talked the other day with, with Neil, um, need for increased facilitator activity. Um, so, for example, increased clarifications, additional prompting to establish shared understanding, consensus building, et cetera. So we're thinking that if you're doing this on telehealth, it's, you're even going to have to be more active in your facilitation of a meeting. And by the way, Neil says hello. Hey, he is doing well. Hey. Uh, in terms of the content Rick, area, quick. just go over these quickly, but I'll let you add, Rachel. Um, yeah. What we talked about, uh, do you want to do these actually? 
No, okay, I'm doing it. So help stay connected. Um, we want to help families feel a sense of connection to the world in a, in a world of social distancing. Um, that they, they don't that they we don't want them to feel alone. Um, we want to give the youth and family hope to get through the next few weeks or even months, depending on how it plays out. On a positive note, we can learn about new family strengths that are uncovered at the time of an external crisis. Um, there could be opportunities to help the family create new routines and family activity time. Um, we do need to address changes in youth and family support system because it's going to look different. Uh, be available for guidance and international support. Um, and I think critically, uh, and I really like you, that you brought up the crisis safety plan stuff, because I think that's so important, and I think that's one of our major roles. But in addition to that, we have to understand that families may also be in a fin financial crisis now. Um, so it's important to address basic needs um, issues that arise. Um, so this is not only a health crisis, it, it, it's turning into quite the financial crisis as well. Um, anything else on that, Rachel, before I just move on? Um, I was just going to say real quick, Neil and I were talking yesterday and you talked about briefly here about um, some things when it comes to your actual facilitation style. Um, you know, really when you're doing this type of work and as we have seen this week as we're doing facilitation, you really do have to take extra time to ask things like, what are everybody's thoughts? What are your concerns? Do we all agree? Do we all disagree? Because we don't necessarily have those facial cues that we can read anymore and we can't tell with the inflection and tone of voice and things like that that you normally do in facilitation. Um, so that's just something to be aware of. You're going to have to remind yourself constantly as you're facilitating, follow up, follow up, keep asking questions, keep asking questions. Don't take silence for silence. You need to get a verbal yes or no from people. I agree or I disagree um, to keep people interacted actually in the conversation and make sure plans and processes, um, ideas are really being understood. Wonderful. Very helpful information. Um, and to end today's uh, didactic, and again, we're flying through this. There's so much to talk about. Um, but we really want to introduce all the material and begin a discussion um, that, that is ongoing. Um, what we want to do also is talk about home visit safety recommendations um, that we have come up with. Um, Certainly there are a number of those recommendations that are put out through the CDC, Ohio Health Department, um, and other folks as well. Um, we have developed just a few. Um, we didn't know if folks were gonna be able to go to the home and if they're going to the home. The reality is, is we provide crisis stabilization services in many of the ways that we do our work. Um, and so we think we need to put out guidance um, a little bit anyway, on what is it to provide a behavioral health service um, out in the environment. Um, so I am, I, I channeled my years and years and years and decades of, of my OCD-ness into <laughs> what would I do if I had to go out? Um, so this is just the world according to me. We'd love to hear your ideas, um, but um, obviously, before you go out, you're going to be asking the family uh, a couple of things. Number one, are you comfortable with us coming out? Um, I would want to pre-structure all the new safety protocols that we're going to follow so the family's not, you know, put off by them. Um, we're going to screen the family uh, for the three major uh, symptoms of COVID, um, fever, coughs, and shortness of breath. Um, we will not go out if in fact, somebody has tested positive or they have the symptoms, um, we'll have to figure out how we handle that, you know, if, if that's the case. But certainly there would be, we'd inquire about whether they've called the health department, if it's been reported and those things. Okay, so let's say it's okay to go out. Um, we still wanna protect the family from us. And I think one of the ways that we, that I heard on the news this week, which I really liked, which is assume you have it. 
and you're wanting to protect everybody around you uh, based on that. So before entering the home, disinfect whatever items you're taking into the house. So it's not only protecting yourself, you're, you're protecting the family. Um, I would use hand sanitizer if you can find some um, prior to entering the home. Um, you, you know, I, this is also brand new to me. I've never done this, but um, using disinfect, disinfectant spray on the soles of your shoes prior to entering a family's home because the virus can track in through your shoes. During the home visit, um, you got to find a space in the house that would have six foot distancing allowed. Um, if in fact there isn't that, can you do it outdoors somewhere um, in, in the immediate environment? Um, and obviously avoid touching surfaces at all possible. Um, uh, before you go back into your car after the visit, uh, you're going to want to, I'm assuming that you, net, you haven't washed your hands, so you're going to use hand sanitizer. Um, I would be thinking about how I disinfect whatever items I took into the family's home, which also brings me to don't take a whole lot in. Um, and you also want to disinfect your shoes by um, spraying them prior to getting into your car, because you could track it into your car. And some additional, um, before you go back into your own house, you know, as soon as you get home, you want to take off your shoes outside the house. You want to wash your hands as soon as you get in the house. Um, you may consider even disinfecting, spraying down your car, um, and then respraying your shoes, yada, yada, and then disinfecting anything that you've taken with you throughout the day, whether it's your computer, et cetera. Um, you might want to think about having a plastic garbage bag near the entrance door to your house so you can shove stuff in there before you get it clean so you can get on with your day, which for me, that would mean extensive washing. Um, and then follow CDC guidelines, et cetera. Love your feedback on some of these. This, this is a lot of detail, um, but this also um, is probably what I would be doing if, if I did a home visit. Um, our guidance at this point in general is if you can avoid a home visit and do telehealth options, that seems like that's the best method to follow the governor's um, guidance on staying, staying home. Here's the uh, resources. We'll post them. There's a bunch of them, including how to talk to kids about it, um, mental health and coping, et cetera. Okay. As you have um, additional comments, um,